Welcome back. We have a treat for you today on Problematic Women. I have Jennifer Lull from the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network, and she has a new movie out called Transmission. Welcome, Jennifer. Great. Thanks for uh, letting me be on your show today. It's really fun to be with you. So I want to take a quick moment and just play a quick clip from the trailer of your movie, Transmission. There are doctors in the U.S. who will go to work today and oversee the chemical castration of little boys who will put 14-year-old girls into menopause and give troubled young girls cosmetic mastectomies. I am transgender. I have completely medically transitioned, and I do not have a dog in this fight. I'm trying to save your kids. My daughter's rush to want testosterone was really fueled by her desire to be seen as male. They were saying biological sex itself is these categories aren't real, male and female, and it's just all on a spectrum. They all just kind of blend together. This was just an absurd claim to me. And that's where I started staking out my territory because I'm a biologist, and so I know what the biology is of biological sex. There are some activists who are powerful, who have money, who have access to politicians and the media and big pharma. The reality is we don't have any long-term studies in children, and there's very good reason to be concerned about the outcome. They scare parents into, your child's going to commit suicide unless you let us put them on these puberty blockers. Do you want a live son or a dead daughter? There is no long-term evidence showing gender affirmation therapy reduces suicides. It's not there. The pediatrician, she said that if I didn't affirm my daughter's identity and I didn't get her the help that she needed and she killed herself, I was going to feel awfully guilty right in front of my daughter. They were laying on the pressure. If your son reaches biological puberty, you're going to miss the opportunity for him to be the person he really wants to be or can be. The reason I'm being difficult in this is not because I don't love her. It's because I love her so much that I am willing to take on this whole ideology just to protect her from potentially making an irreversible decision in her future. My name is Natasha Chart from New York State. I will not be forced to lie. I will not submit. So Jennifer, why did you decide to produce the documentary Transmission? Yeah, I get asked that question a lot because most of my past films have been in the area of assisted reproduction. So documentary films about young women who sold their eggs to help somebody have a baby or women who were surrogate mothers who had devastating complications of their surrogate pregnancies. And my background is in pediatric nursing. So once I saw the trans issue sort of creeping into my space on assisted reproduction. So we started having men having babies, and then we had trans men and trans women having babies. And then a new study came out that said trans women who were really biological males now want uterine transplants. And that's all in my space of high-tech pregnancies. And then because of my background in pediatric nursing, when I found out that children, young boys, young girls, before they medically and surgically transition to the opposite, opposite sex, which I would say that they can't do, um, are offered fertility preservation. So little girls, young girls, are offered to freeze and bank their eggs so that when they transition to a man and they grow up and want to have children, they can go to the egg bank and get their own eggs. And similarly, the same thing for young boys are offered to bank and freeze their sperm. So once they become a woman, in scare quotes, they can go back to the sperm bank and use their sperm to have their biological children. So sort of that collision of mm -hmm. assisted reproduction and my background in pediatric nursing and the fact that this is harmful and dangerous to children, I had to make transmission. Well, what stood out to me about the documentary was just the sheer number of voices that you were able to include. Can you just introduce us to a few that stick out to you and tell us, where they stand on, on you know, our traditional political scale. Yeah, we were able to do sit-down interviews, um, some, of course, because of the pandemic, were Zoom interviews with 17 people. Again, because of my background in, in nursing, clinical nursing, we, of course, interviewed doctors. 
And we interviewed doctors on both sides of the debate. So a pediatrician, for example, was interviewed who supports this, and she runs the gender clinic at her university. And then we interviewed, of course, doctors who are on the opposite side and say that we should not be doing this, who are pediatric endocrinologists or general family practice doctors. We had to interview parents. Because they're the ones that front and center are really dealing with this with their own children, their own schools, their near their neighborhood, their families. And then a good handful of activists, people who are just out there speaking out against this for various reasons. And then finally, the most probably important voice, which is a really rising voice in this debate, is what we call the detransitioners, people who were told – if you medically and surgically transition, that will fix your problems, your gender dysphoria, your feelings of being born in the wrong body, only to find out after they had done that full medical and surgical transition, it didn't solve their problems. Wow. So you, you mentioned that you were a nurse for over 20 years. And now, you, not only did you produce this film and, and lots of other films, you run a the Center for Bioethics and Culture. So what was that journey from becoming a nurse to where you are now as a public advocate? Yeah, well, you know, nurses are often really, you know, um, motivated by education. I mean, we are educators. We're always educating our pa our patients on how to take their medication, how to take better care of their health. And in, in the case of pediatrics, which is was the bulk of my nursing career, was educating parents as well as children because you want children to, you know, especially like a newly diagnosed young kid has to learn how to test their blood glucose and, and give their own insulin and stuff like that. So um, so it was a natural, um, you know, sort of move into the educational nonprofit world in a space that I already cared a lot about. I saw, you know, I worked in academic university medical centers, UCLA, UC San Francisco, Children's Hospital, Oakland, where you're dealing with sort of the next wave of what's the new technology mm -hmm. that was coming down the pike. So I'm really interested in the ethics. we got to get it mm -hmm. right. It's not just can we do it, you know, the question, can we do it, but should we do it? And in the case of parents, you know, they have to make life and death on the fly decisions for their children that they have to live with the rest of their life. So making sure that parents can make good decisions for the well-being of their children. So I want to start with kind of the journey of t today of a child that comes out, let's say, in a, in a liberal state and says, OK, mom, dad, I'm, I'm transgender. So why do folks now advocate to rush to put them on puberty blockers? And then what are the dangers of those puberty blockers when they go on them? Well, I think one of the rushes is that it's, it's a really um, highly polarized ideology right now. It's become very political. And you're either, you know, a bigot, a transphobe, a hater, or you're tolerant. Um, and so nobody wants to be framed as a, a bigot. You know, that's one of the reasons why doctors are feeling sort of pushed into doing things that they know is not good medicine, because they don't want to be shunned by their professional society. I mean, the American Pediatric Society, American Academy of Pediatrics, sorry, and the American Endocrine Society for Pediatrics all support the transitioning of, of minors. Um, so you're out of step. So there's that sort of ideological pressure. Um, there's societal, there's, you know, social media pressure. I mean, how many times you open up the newspaper, a new, a new celebrity has said, I'm non-binary, I'm asexual. I mean, Cuomo, Governor Cuomo's daughter just came out, you know, as this new demisexual. Um, so it's sort of the new hip thing. And it's trending on all the social media. And kids are spending a lot of time on TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat. And this is all just blowing up there. Um, so I think that's the rush. It's now seen as this is the appropriate, rubber stamped by the professional bodies, that this is the appropriate therapy and treatment of these young children. So why not first try something like counseling rather than pushing these kids to, you know, alter their bodies forever? Yeah, because in the olden days, you know, when I was working <laughs> pediatric nursing, that was the, the rational, let's just wait. There is no rush. Let's get good counseling. Let's find out what's going on in the home, in the school, in the community. How much time are these kids spending on social media? And get a really good assessment of what's going on and treat those kind of problems. Um, and that's really unfortunate because, and, you know, and some of my colleagues and my um, uh you know, people that are I watch on social media say, you know, much of this is driven by money. Uh, one of the physicians in the film says, once you have medicalized a child, you have a patient for life. 
you know, so somebody who makes a decision to live the rest of their life, I'm from California, like Caitlyn Jenner, you know, Caitlyn Jenner will forever have to be medicalized Mm -hmm. um, in order to present himself as a woman. And I say himself because he is a man, he's a biological man, and I refuse to call Caitlyn Jenner um, uh, a woman. And so one of the biggest arguments that someone who would want to put a child on puberty blockers is if you don't do it, they're going to be at higher risk of suicide, um, that they're you know going to struggle with depression. I mean, have you found that to be the case? I found that that threat is is very prevalent. And several of the parents we interviewed in transmission say, you know, oftentimes in front of the child being there, which I find is unconscionable, that a physician would say to a parent in front of the child, if you don't affirm your child's you know, desire to transition, you know, they could take their own life. And the, and this, the uh, data doesn't bear that out. Um, so it's just a um, sort of a, a, a scare tactic. And how old are these kids? I mean, maybe you can make the argument that someone who's 17, 18 is, is closer to being an adult. But what? how does the age of consent play in as children are making these decisions. Yeah, it's, it's um, again, it's scary to me that, you know, there's children as young as four and five wow. that are being allowed to at least socially transition. And by socially, I mean they're being allowed to dress in mm-hmm. opposite sex clothing. They're being allowed to call themselves a, a boy name if they're a little girl and use their, you know, preferred pronouns and stuff like that. So it is becoming younger and younger. Um, but again, it gets back to what is really going on with this new kind of trend that we have all these young people that are born in the wrong body. Well, and, and you mentioned the word trend. How is this playing out, not necessarily as a growing kind of medical diagnosis, but kind of a, a social contaminant within schools and, and friend groups with kids? Yeah, I mean, I, what I found in my research um, for this film, and then of course just speaking with people in the making of the film, is that a lot of these children have been, um, you know, perhaps somewhere on the autism spectrum. You know, one of the dads in the film, his son has been diagnosed as autistic. You know, one little girl has struggled when her parents went through a nasty divorce. And so that causes these kind of, you know, um, stressors and trauma that they're experiencing and they're reacting to their trauma. And today, a lot of times people just say, oh, well, you're probably born in the wrong body and you you should live your life. And that will solve your, it gets, again, back to the detransitioners. You know, this is what will fix your problems. This is what will deal with your trauma. And kids that are normally bullied or on the spectrum that are sort of outcasts are now celebrated. If they come out as trans, they're kind of like the cool kids um, versus just that awkward little boy that nobody wants to pick to be on their, you know, sport team like was the case when I was growing up. Uh, you also had on the documentary a woman that has been on the show and I, I think is such a powerful voice, and that's Natasha Chart. And, you know, she's some radical feminist. And, and it's just amazing to me how these, these stories all play together um, of showing, you know, how us as women, um, you know, w- there's such a history of, you know, women not being thought as good as. But w- this is just kind of playing out in a different way. Yeah, well, Natasha would be probably one of those women that would be called a problematic woman <laughs> yes. because she doesn't tow the, you know, the politically correct narrative. And when you look at, you know, uh, feminist, radical feminist groups, um, uh, you know, they have fought long and hard for safe places for women. And now we've got, you know, this gentleman who's competing as a woman in the Olympics coming up soon. We've got in my state, California, we have way too many, over hundred, several hundred men who have now identified as women so they can be incarcerated in female prisons. And so, you know, women who have fought long and hard like Natasha Chart for protections of women and young girls, you know, see this being whitewashed by you know, Biden and Kamala Harris's Equality Act and, you know, legislation that's happening here on Capitol Hill that is trying to be inclusive and protective of people like transgender people, um, but at the expense of women and girls. Well, and the parents in the documentary, they didn't even seem like when their kids told them, you know, I'm transgender, they were like, wow, this is the end of the world. They were just trying to find additional resources and they were trying to find people to support them through their journey who will give them fair answers and will tell them, you know, what they what they can and, and should do. Uh, what resources would you recommend for anybody or especially any parent in this situation? 
Yeah. Well, first, I would just agree with what you just said. And I, I was really saddened sitting down with a lot of these parents because they do feel like everybody's against them. Their pediatrician is telling them, you need to affirm this. Their school is saying, you need to affirm your child. Oftentimes, their own family. Um, so it's causing stress within families. Um, so, uh, but yeah, what, well, there are good uh, therapists out there. There are good pediatricians out there. Um, there are, uh, and when I say good, people that are going to look at what's going on with this child and not rush them uh, down on the transgender track of, of uh, conversion to the opposite sex. Um, so, I, you know, people are welcome to contact me, um, but there's a lot of parent support groups out there that are um, coming together. I mean, we've seen that just in sort of the critical race theory debates and how and the shutting down of schools during the COVID pandemic. I mean, parents are a powerful block that can come together. And so there are several really good parent support groups out there that can instantly put people wherever you live, you know, with perhaps somebody in your, your town or your community um, that would um, be a good, a, a good resource. Jennifer, why do you use tools like documentaries to get out your message? Well, stories are powerful. Um, you know, and like it or not, we're a visual culture. I mean, we know people are less literate and <laughs> less willing to read. I mean, I open up articles all the time and they'll say, you know, read time, three minutes. They're trying to hook you. It's only going to take you three, time, <laughs> three minutes. Please read this. Um, and, but we've just found that telling people stories um, sort of invites people in. Um, and there's a lot of noise around the trans debate. Uh, so there's a lot of screaming and name calling and viciousness out there. But through the power of storytelling, um, you know, you can really get people to stop and listen and go, oh, I never thought about that side of this debate. Well, and, and what is, excuse me, and what has the reception to transmission been? I, I saw on YouTube, it was awesome. It had like almost 40,000 views. But what have folks who've seen the documentary been telling you about it? Well, it's, yes, it's had a lot of views and it's not even been out a month yet. Wow. So um, it's had over 40,000 views. Overwhelmingly, the comments are very positive. We thought it immediately, you know, maybe YouTube would pull the, mm -hmm. the film because we know that, you know, books have been pulled when you think of Ryan Anderson's book or Abigail Schreier's book. Um, so we were, one, we're just really pleased with the reception that YouTube hasn't, you know, pulled the <laughs> film. Um, and we've been told, you know, so many, I mean, immediately I got emails from parent, these parent support groups that said, thank you so much for making this film. What we've noticed, though, even though a lot of people are watching it, there's not a lot of that thing that you measure the likes and the shares because mm -hmm. people don't want to be outed, we think. Oh, and if you like wow. and share something, people go, oh, you're one of them. You're anti-trans. You're a transphobe. You're a, you know. So while the people are watching it and people are privately uh, contacting me. Not to say that people yeah. aren't liking or sharing it, but our social media team, which this is their space, mm -hmm. um, they're like, this is really an interesting phenomenon here that a lot of people are watching it, but not a lot of people are saying, hey, I want you all to watch this film. It's really great. <laughs> but wow. it gets back to just how polemic mm -hmm. and how charged this this topic is. And people don't want to lose their job. Yeah. You wow. know, people don't want to, you know, go have their kids go to school and go, oh, your mom and dad are haters and bigots. Um, so, wow, that is, that is so interesting. And as someone who's been on the, at the Heritage Foundation, we've had content taken down for, um, very similar reasons. And so, wow, I, I, that is really interesting, but we appreciate you putting up the good fight and, and getting out really thoughtful and, and important information. So if any of our listeners would like to watch the video, where can they find it and where can they find your work? Well, it's on our uh, YouTube channel, the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network channel. It's free to watch. It's also on Vimeo. We put it on a second mm -hmm. platform. Just but in it, case. Yeah, just <laughs> in case. But um, Or they can go to our website, cbc-network.org, and find all of our films there. Um, but yeah, please do watch it. And if you're bold enough, like it and share it. <laughs> Tell your friends to watch it. Well, Jennifer, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.